evening. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful night when you could be out walking your dog or something. Um, maybe, hopefully, a little more entertaining. I'm going to try to not look too much like a spooky thoroughbred who just got off the racetrack wondering. Um, I have this thing about speakers and feedback, so I'm, I'm normally fairly sane and not too anxious, but it's my pet bugaboo in life. All right, everybody can hear all the way back? We're good? All righty then. So of all the lectures that I give and all the topics that I cover as a speaker, and that's pretty broad, this is the one that if I had my druthers, I'd never have to give again for the rest of my professional life. The saddest part to me is that this is one of the best attended of all the topics that I offer every time it's given, whether it's as a two-day workshop where we work hands-on with dogs, or it's given as an evening lecture. It is very, very well attended, which breaks my heart. It means there's a lot of people out there trying to help a lot of anxious and fearful and shy animals. So the goal for tonight is to take you on a quick trip. This is by no means an exhaustive look at anxiety or fear in the dog. It is certainly not going to give you recipes that you can scribble down and go home and ta-da, voila, magic, he's cured. What I want to send you home with is number one, an idea of, of really understanding the distinction between fear and anxiety, a really deep empathetic understanding of what these animals are going through. It's very easy for us to be up here watching someone else have that moment, but they're really having it. Um, and it, it requires a lot more responsibility when you really become empathetic with what's going on inside them, but it also gives you tools um, to make better decisions on their behalf. And that's, that's what, to me, living with animals is all about, that, that moral obligation we have, having chosen to share our lives with them, we then owe them the very best we've got to offer. And that includes being knowledgeable and therefore making informed choices for them. And it, it may upset some of you when you realize, wow, this dog really is not, not as capable of, as I thought of a bigger world. This is taking a bigger toll. But I want to give you a way to actually scale that, balance it, and be able to think about the dogs in your care and the ones that come through your hands in a different way. So while it's a fairly serious topic, I'm anything but serious as a rule. I mean, my bumper sticker for life is, life is way too important to take seriously, and I believe that. So feel free. It's a bit of a go. If you really have a question, raise your hand. I will try not to devolve into case histories, and my little dog, Pierre, when he sees the mailman dressed up as an M&M, gets very worried, what should I do? <laughs> Those kind of questions are a little perhaps too specific, but um, I certainly can entertain some questions. I'm a lot like Amtrak, derailed frequently, mostly get y'all there. <laughs> All right, and I got my good friend here, Ted, doing the videotaping, and Eve, poor thing, <laughs> will be in charge of trying to understand what in God's name Suzanne is meaning when she says, next slide please. All right, so it's a disturbing image, isn't it? <laughs> it's just a disturbing image. I put this up on my big screen at home when I was uh, just running through this one last time last night. My husband sees it from the kitchen. He's like, good Lord, what is that? And I said, come on, you know what it is. And he's like, that's just freaky weird. So it's not a creature you've encountered, I'm quite sure, since I made it up. It's actually a photo that I mucked around with of one of the Highland calves that was uh, orphaned and lived in our, our kitchen, I mean our, our living room for oh, quite, quite a long time, till he was about that big. Um, this is just a photo I played with. But the weird feeling you get when you look at this photo, it makes you oddly anxious, doesn't it? Because you're not sure, what is that? And that's just a photo. Imagine I had it flying over your heads and it would, it would come and it would hover right in front of your face. And is it friendly? Is it venomous? Is it need a home? Should I take it home? What does it eat? How big does it get? Is that a baby? Um, so you have a lot of questions about this crazy little image. And I can explain it so you think, ah, it's just a trick with photography. Okay, nothing to worry about or not, and this is where we end up with our dogs. I can explain a lot to you, human to human. I can, I can put your mind at rest. I can, I can tell you things that will make you very anxious. I can tell you things that will make you very afraid, and I can also ease your, your mind very nicely. I cannot do that for the dogs. So we have a couple of goals here is to understand what's going on actually for them, 
and then what are the choices we can make. Okay, you've, so there are things that actually scare people as a rule. Um, I enjoyed putting this slide up at one point in the Association of Pet Dog Trainers. So it was, I don't know, 10 foot tall screen on each side of me. And I just left it up there because I picked the three things that um, statistically are liable to annoy or upset most everyone in the audience. I don't know what the deal is with clowns, but this guy I would not invite to my child's party. I just would, if I saw his brochure at the supermarket, I'm not picking up, you know, Buffo the Clown, taking that one home. So for many people, snakes is a source of anxiety um, to such an extent that some people won't go walk in the woods, you know. For others, it's spiders. I just read a very fo funny column about why women should just go ahead and kill their own spiders. Thank you very much. Us men are tired of doing it. <laughs> I'm of the spider-loving clan so that I've been known to rescue really scary spiders and get appalled if someone kills one in my presence. Um, but I'm not the, the normal girl in many ways. So some of you may just feel a little unease. Some of you are really okay with these. And if I said there's real snakes under your seat, by the way, so don't move, uh, changes everything just a little bit, doesn't it? So I just want you to hang on to this thing that you guys know a lot about fear and you know a lot about anxiety because you've experienced it. Nobody here is so young that they've not experienced both, and quite often is what I suspect. All right, so fear is very real. I didn't take this photo. I took most of the other ones in the slides. But this one I found on the internet, and it is such a classically great shot. This spaniel is not kidding. <laughs> this spaniel is not telling himself ghost stories at night about what would happen if, and I read this scary book about this dog. No, no, there's a real actual target there. There's something really real facing him that he needs to deal with. So the fact that dogs mostly indulge themselves in ritualized aggression and most of the time they don't actually hurt each other doesn't change the fact that right this minute this dog genuinely feels threatened. So fear is very important. Without it, survival isn't possible. You have to have the sense to run away from what hurts you or could kill you. There's a very interesting ongoing experiment right now with a woman who had a portion of her brain um, accidentally destroyed. I can't remember if it was by trauma or disease. Either way, she's lost her amygdala. And so she's afraid of nothing. Not only that, she has no memories. So she'll get shocked by electric current and she's like, huh. She has no fear of the, of the bare wire. She has no fear of poisonous snakes. She has no fear of cutting herself. She has no fear of the edge of cliffs. Everything, you know, they're not actually like putting her in a room with cobras and going, so how you doing, Betty, all right? <laughs> How's that for you, hon? But the scientists that are studying her are really fascinated to see that without this process at work, the very natural and normal process of fear, she's actually in grave danger because she neither remembers what hurt her or was dangerous, nor does she anticipate it nor does she recognize threats at all. So fear is very, very real, and it has a specific um, target. Your brain is actually looking at something absolutely, it's real. It's not something you're anticipating, it's actually happening. It can be debilitating. Fear can absolutely lock someone up so that they're frozen. And there's two ways to freeze. One is to go into an absolute, I can't respond. You'll hear people say, why didn't you yell for help? I couldn't. And now that the scientists are beginning to understand how this part of the brain works, they're understanding that, no kidding, it can get so locked down that you actually can barely breathe. So I remember many years ago, I had a third story apartment and I had a crazy job managing a barn of 25, 26 horses and a young shepherd. So there was times when during the day, taking care of all these horses, I did not have what it took to meet his needs. So sometimes between midnight and two o'clock in the morning, it would be me and this dog out in the park, playing ball, playing games, doing training, whatever it took to get him tired. And it was, the town we lived in was okay. The next town over, not so okay. Um, but I really figured in a municipal park at two o'clock in the morning, I was safe. So I had tied my young dog to a, a picnic bench and I went off to lay a track. Who <laughs> lays tracks in the dark? I do. So be sure you know where your track is or sort of guess wildly. Apparently that was my plan. And I, I'm laying the track and I'm coming back across the field and out of nowhere this guy just walks up and he goes, hey baby, 
I'm like, <laughs> the only thing worth having with me was the big black shepherd who's tied up over there, uh, quite a ways away. He's not even got a visual bead on me as far as I can tell. And I remember all I could do was say his name about this loud, Pear. And the guy's like, what? <laughs> and then to my absolute delight, absolute delight, like a rocket out of the dark came this very black dog who said, I think you've made a very big mistake. <laughs> so I thanked Jesus a lot, and then I thanked the dog a lot, and then I thanked Jesus. It went on like that for a while. And I was really glad I just used a canvas leash because he snapped it. He heard me, and he came. I'm like, wow. Another reason not to use nylon leashes, just saying. <laughs> I have my preferred equipment. I have long experience as to why. So that's one of them. So in that moment, you know, I was, I was in a bit of a panic. I did not have full control of my faculties. Very much tunnel vision on what was happening in front of me. You know, there's not this huge awareness. Things start to narrow down right to a really serious... This is what I have to pay attention to. So that it could have been hard. If someone else had been calling my name, I don't know that I would have heard them. I don't know that I saw anything except that guy. You know, and he's maybe this far away from me just standing there. It, it was a pleasure to watch his face change. <laughs> I have to admit, having a big shepherd show up, you should step away from her. It's very impressive. So many reasons I love my breed. Um, he never laid a glove on the guy. He just came silently and then boof, boof, boof. This guy's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, yeah, you better get out of here. So once the dog appeared, my fear disappeared. So it was really good. But we use the word that this is a fearful dog. We use that a lot. So when you find yourself saying that, you want to know what is the definitive object? What is the actual focus of that fear? He's just fearful in general. That's not accurate. What you mean is he's anxious, he's waiting, The fear has a specific. So if you tell me he's afraid of men in uniforms, all men in uniforms, all men with just hats, men in brown trucks that say UPS on the side, you know, how specific does he get? He doesn't like children, he's afraid of children. Again, toddlers, babies, the greater specificity you have, the more you can figure out how to help the dog, whether that's management, or trying to help him develop some skills around these things that he's actually afraid of. You know, there are dogs that are afraid of sharp, sudden noises. I would be one of those dogs because <laughs> I haven't been punished too much by these speakers, but believe me, a lifetime of doing this, I'm, I'm really very leery of speakers. You'd think they'd bit me just as well. So be specific about what it is the dog's afraid of. He can be afraid of just novelty. So there's a part of the brain that's very interesting, as Temple Grandin that actually defined this for me, and it's called the nucleus accumbens. And this is the part of the brain that they're looking at in addiction, because it, it tips both ways. It goes towards things, it's interested in seeking behavior, wanting behavior, because addicts will tell you they don't like the drug, they don't like the alcohol. In fact, they'll often say, I hate this, and I hate what it's doing to me, but I want it. It's a wanting, not necessarily liking, and those are not necessarily the same. So that's one part of the, the function of the nucleus accumbens is to be attracted towards, to be seeking. The other part is avoidance, is to be careful of and, and, and fearful of. So the interesting part that, that Temple helped me understand was that animals that grow up in very safe, enriched environments, their nucleus accumbens develops so that it is more heavily tipped towards being interested in moving towards and seeking and wanting. The animals who grow up in threatening, unsafe, or unenriched environments are more heavily tipped towards fearful responses. So that when a novel object is presented, and that could just be a plastic bag blown across the street, the animal who grew up in a safe, enriched environment is very likely to say, well, cool. I wonder what that is. I'm sure there's a pony in that bag. You know, and things I would say if I was a dog. The other animals, uh-uh, they look at the same exact plastic bag blowing across the street and they go, oh, dear God. I'm convinced most horses are on that particular part of the spectrum that could eat us. We could die. 
Now, those of you who've dealt with horses know horses spend a lot of time saying that oh, we could die. You know? <laughs> and the person on their back is going, yes, we could. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a reason I'm limping at 53, and it's way too many horses are like, we're going to die. Like, well, why don't you just go do that by yourself and not take me with you? Okay. <laughs> they took me up on that invitation to, to go our separate ways, repeatedly. All right, next slide, please. So very often what we're talking about is, unless there's a specific focus for that, what we're actually talking about when we say this is a fearful dog so we often mean this is an anxious dog. This is an anxious dog. So you have two varieties of anxiety. One is trait anxiety, and the other one is state anxiety. So when we say that it's um, a state anxiety, you might be a really normal, pretty well put together human. And you can handle most anything except, oh my God, there's a mouse in the kitchen. You can become very anxious about the fact that you saw one little mouse turn the corner, so somewhere in this room, there is a loose mouse. You know there's a loose mouse. You don't know where he is, but he's here. You know it. You can hear him scurrying behind things. That's a state anxiety. And once the actual thing that triggered that state of anxiety has been removed or relieved, you'll resume. You'll go back to normal. The trait anxious animal or person, on the other hand, just has a tendency to be more anxious. They're just literally more anxious all the time. And you will see this in um, animals very, very early on. As someone who's done a ton of puppy testing over the years, you, uh, you'll see this in all the species I've worked with. I, I've seen it in cats. I've seen it in pigs, horses, cattle, dogs. Oh my, even the rats we had. <clears throat> we, we adopted some rats who turned out to be pregnant, so we had a lot of rats. <laughs> They were, they were very good little rats. The babies were wonderful because they were handled and socialized and lived in a rich environment. So they were like, oh, a paper bag, yay! They're all about that. So this, this trait anxiety is, is where we get into trouble because anxiety can look the same if this animal is genetically kind of hardwired for it or he simply doesn't have a lot of experience, exposure, and training to cope with what he's being asked with. And this is where I think trainers fail the general public in not helping you distinguish this dog is really having trouble here and needs a smaller world or some other form of management or resolution. And this dog, he's really not an anxious guy. He just doesn't know how to do this thing because those are two very separate issues to address. So anxiety is a very unpleasant emotion. All of us have been anxious, whether that was waiting for the vet to call and tell us what the blood results were, or waiting for someone to come out of surgery, or wondering if we've got enough gas fumes in the middle of the night to coast down Route 80 outside of Philly and get to a guest. I'm just saying, you know, it was a long road. I chose the downhill road because I had a theory I could coast into the gas station. I was right. Put it in neutral. I actually coasted in going, whew, guest right. So, it can be brief. It can be the, oh, I'm not sure where I should park. Oh, I'm not sure where I should sit. Oh my God, are we on time? Is it going to start too late? That's a very brief little flare of anxiety. Or it can be very, very sustained. Both of them can do some harm in terms of what happens to our overall being and our, our health and our immune system. What anxiety is about is about a possibility. So if I were to, I'll describe a, a walk that a friend of mine took me on. We're in Alaska, and Alaskans, if you haven't met one, they're a strange people. <coughs> they take the fact that they're late for the seminar because a moose was sleeping in their driveway as just a, well, what could we do? <laughs> for those of us used to white-tailed deer where we go, hey, get out of here. <laughs> Look, I'm a human. The deer run away. The moose is like, excuse me? <laughs> I'm taking a nap here. When I'm done, I'll leave or not. They're huge. They're, they're massively huge. So you see when I'm close, you realize I'd stay inside and watch TV too until Mr. Moose decided to leave. So this crazy friend of mine says, let's go hiking. It's a nice little walk. I take it every day. It's just behind the place where I work. She works for the, the crime lab in Alaska and Anchorage. 
So we're walking along, and I'm like, la, 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 la. You know, it's cool to see some wildlife. And I look down, and there's a bear paw print that's probably this wide, at least. <laughs> it's gotten bigger over the years. But I am not exaggerating when I say it was this wide. This is, this is like close to 10 inches wide. I'm like, huh. And the claw marks in the mud were so big that I could take my index finger and put them in and have room to spare. And I am not an expert tracker, but there was still water seeping from the mud into the tracks. This indicates a fairly fresh track. And as you can guess, a very large bear. So I said, well, uh, that looks kind of fresh. She goes, oh, probably two or three hours. And I'm like, huh, all the tracking books I've read indicate otherwise, but sure, we'll go with that. So how big would a bear be that left that big a footprint? This is what she says calmly. Oh, probably just 10 or 11 feet tall when he stands up. <laughs> I'm, in my head, I'm like, so he's two of me. Is he still around here? She goes, probably. Well, she sees a look on my face. Not, you know, probably not. But as long as we make noise, we're OK. This was the most anxiety-ridden hiking I've ever done in my whole life. So like an idiot, I didn't say, you know, let's go back. We'll go to the mall. We'll hike around the Alaskan Mall. And we'll go around your yard for an hour and a half. I don't care. But no, no, stupidly, I'm like, all right, even though my brain's going, that's a fresh track. That's a big bear. We'll be fine as long as we make noise. What does that mean? I don't know. I said, well, should I climb a tree or should? She goes, well, there's only two kinds of trees in Alaska. One is the kind you can climb, and so can the bear. And the other one is the kind you can't climb, and it doesn't matter because they can knock them down anyway. Like, so I, I, I agree. I go on this, this, this hour and a half hike with her like a lunatic. And my heart is like pounding out of my chest. But then every now and then we'd see a wild plant. We'd be like, oh, look at this flower. We get all quiet, like, you know, we're having some magical National Geographic moment with the wild moss flower things. And then I'm like, we haven't made any noise lately. <laughs> hey, Mr. Bear, we're here. We're still here. So we get back to her truck. She goes, wasn't that invigorating? I'm like, or exhausting. I think my adrenals have fallen out of my body. I, I don't know that I've had that much sustained adrenaline for fun in a long time. So I, I can vouch for this. It could be sustained for much longer than an hour and a half hike with an Alaskan, but she did admit later that it was probably only maybe 20 to 30 minutes old, that track. And Mr. Bear was definitely still in the neighborhood. So don't go, don't go hiking with Alaskans. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> so it wasn't that we actually saw a bear or even heard a bear. We saw a track. So the anxiety was because of the possibility, a very real possibility, I would like to point out. But it was a possibility. And this is what anxiety does for you. It increases your sensitivity so that every time her dog would be on the path ahead of us went, Ugh. we're like, Ugh. well, she was like, what is it, boy? I'm like, eh, we're going to die. Why are his hackles going up? Oh, it could be a wolf, she says. It could be a wolf or a lynx, maybe. I'm like, what kind of a walk is this? So it increased my sensitivity. Every little thing that snapped in the woods, you know, it was an exhilarating walk, I'll say that. So it increases the animal sensitivity. So, and you know this, right? You've had a friend who's anxious, and you walk up and you tap them, and they, they jump out of their skin. You're like, how oh, easy they're down on the coffee. Chill out. Oh, I'm just so worried. Because this is what it does for the dogs, too. So for those of you who do assessments and evaluations and have to handle dogs you don't know, one of the quick and dirty tips for figuring out how anxious a dog might be is I simply take a small treat and I lob it right at him. I am not doing this. I'm not threatening him by throwing it at it. I want to know what happens when something unexpectedly touches him because I can get two responses. One, he's so focused on something else he doesn't even notice. Or, I'm not sure how anxious he looks, but I'm thinking he is. That little treat, because first he goes, what? And then he eats it, so it works out. Um, that little jump says, hmm, as I suspected, you're a little bit more anxious in this situation than people may realize. So it's just a, a nice, quick way to get yourself safely a little bit of info that might pay off. 
because the next problem we have with anxious dogs is that they are very liable to misunderstand or misperceive threats and signals. So you got two problems. One is because they're, they're worried about the possibility of, they're actually looking for, and it's, sometimes it's just undefined. I don't know what's going on here, so they're already tipping towards that fearful part of the brain, that avoidant part of the brain, and they're not sure what it is, so when someone steps out and goes, hey, they're not like, yay, they go, whoa, they go the other way. And there's a really interesting part that would be really valuable for all handlers to remember is that when we become ambiguous in our signals, when we become unclear or inconsistent, this is very hard on the anxious animal. And here's why. When an animal is anxious or depressed, and sometimes they're both together, they are very likely to misinterpret a signal in the worst possible way. So that a dog who's feeling confident and not anxious and we bend over and we're a little too enthusiastic about how much we just love dogs. That dog may say, you know those primates? That's what they do. <laughs> you know, Trish McConnell nailed it. She nailed it. We are hooting primates that cannot help but reach and grab things. So we think we grow up and stop being toddlers. We don't. We just wear fancier clothes and have credit cards. <laughs> so the confident dog sees that and, and reads it correctly as there's no threat implied here. It's just another species being stupid. The same way if you've watched people who don't know dogs, they'll have a big friendly goofball dog jump on them and what do they do? <gasps> I think he's trying to attack me. It's like, well his tail couldn't have wagged any faster and if he could have kissed more square inches of you, he probably would have, but no, that's not an attack but they also don't understand, so they misread that signal. They've done some very, very cool studies in, they've done it now in rats, pigs, humans, birds, and dogs, where they showed if the animal was anxious and or depressed, depending on the species, they were more likely to interpret an unclear signal in the worst possible way. So one of my favorites was they taught birds to be optimist pessimists because some birds naturally were. I don't know why, it just struck me as really funny. I just, I go through the woods now thinking there's some bird go, well, what's the point, frankly? <laughs> I guess the sun will come up again tomorrow and I have to make a nest and sing. And you know, the ones you hear singing apparently are the optimist birds who aren't depressed. But what they did was teach them that black meant there was no food in that container and white meant there absolutely was. And then they began to just elide that difference until it was kind of a weird shade of gray. And some of the birds, literally, as it became more approaching an ambiguous signal, they wouldn't even try it. They wouldn't even like peck the lid to see what was there. Where the other birds were like, what the heck, give it a roll, let's see, yes, there are worms for me. I thought that was really interesting. But it struck me as a trainer, what if we have an anxious dog and we have an unclear signal? We have an ambiguous signal. We have inconsistency in what we say or do. They may take it in the worst possible light so that what seems to be an innocuous gesture on our part can actually be very anxiety producing for these dogs. It can make their anxiety worse. Do you ever tell someone, oh, how's, how's that shirt? Yeah, nice shirt. And they're like, does it make me look fat? I probably shouldn't have worn it tonight. I knew I shouldn't have worn it. But like, uh, someone else, you could say nice shirt, and they're like, I know, I love this. I got it when I was in Catalina on vacation. Oh, we had such a good time. I just love this shirt. Whenever I wear it, I think about it. Both ends are interesting as responses, but the depressed or anxious person can take that very ambiguous, hey, nice shirt, and turn it into a big drama, and someone else could interpret it as hopefully you meant it, which is nice shirt. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Leaves in them. So, for the anxious dogs, consistency and real clarity of communication matters a great deal. So when I have owners of um, anxious dogs that I'm working with, one thing I want to make sure of is that they're very clear and deliberate in their communications. Doesn't mean you can't have several signals for the same thing, but it needs to be clear.
And these are the dogs that the whole family needs to be on the same page. A confident butthead adolescent dog, you know, dad could say it one way, mom can say it another, the kids can say it another, the dog will work it all out without too much grief. But if you're working with an anxious dog, really work hard to make sure everyone is doing the same thing because it's that predictability which takes the ambiguity out of it for the dog. He understands what that means. Make sense? You know that when you drive someplace and it's a detour. Some of us just get irritated and decide we're going to drive through the cones. Some of us just drive around trying to reprogram our GPSs. And some people get very anxious, well, where am I supposed to go? And there's, you know, the cops at the intersection almost never tell you, well, go that way. You're like, but I'm from seven states over. I don't know where that way, go, go that way. <laughs> Depends how anxious you are, how well you'll deal with that. All right, next slide, please. Any questions about that? Makes perfect sense. All right. So, this is a nice shot I took up in Vermont in the old, old graveyard because there's a strange notion at work in the dog world these days that arousal is bad. Your dog should never be allowed to get too excited or hepped up and play ball or run wildly through the streets. Um, well, you shouldn't do that probably. That arousal is bad. And I, I would just like to point out that no arousal looks like that. <laughs> because arousal is actually what keeps you alive. That's why you haven't slid off your seat and aren't snoring on the floor. It's why I'm able to do my job. I have enough arousal to keep it going. What the trainers are trying to say in a simplified top 10 ways to keep your dog from getting too aroused kind of way is excessive arousal is not good. Unproductive, dysfunctional arousal is not good. It's like you think about a bunch of kids running around the backyard and they're screaming and they're having a good time and then every parent on the planet knows the sound of, uh-oh, <laughs> oh dear. Even if you haven't had kids, if you've ever hosted a dinner party, particularly at the holidays where families are involved, you also know that sound. You can be washing up in the kitchen and you think, oh, sounds like Uncle Ed's going off on that <laughs> tangent of his. So, hey, who wants pie? I am really quite convinced that Pi was actually created as a social facilitator to help women interrupt those moments when bloodshed was about to occur, and now their attention is turned to pumpkin or pecan, pumpkin or pecan. Focus with us, boys. You can have both. And we add the whipped cream just to make sure everyone stops. So what we mean is that too much arousal, where someone has lost it, they're going over the top, they're no longer appropriate. They're not in control of themselves. They're not aware of what they're doing socially. They're saying and doing things that are going to be hurtful to others and potentially to themselves. And if you doubt that, go to a, a mall on any Friday or Saturday night and watch. And watch what happens. Because you'll see kids that are loud and you'll see kids that are jacked up and they're aroused. But when they go past the little old lady, they'll still make the detour. They will still take care about their environment and the other people in it. Yes, they're loud, yes, they're annoying, but they're not actually doing any harm. But if you were standing in the mall, what you saw coming down was people getting knocked over and garbage cans getting kicked. If you had any sense as a social being, whoa. Suddenly you become alarmed because now what you recognize, these kids are too aroused. This is where the danger is. This is where they no longer have control. So keep that in mind, because one of the things that can draw other dogs' attention and get them in deep trouble is when they are too aroused. <laughs> you do that in the presence of most German shepherds, and they are quite convinced there's a Labrador or a retriever coming down the street <laughs> who apparently grew up in someone's backyard and needs manners. <laughs> I've actually done it by accident in seminars when I make that noise. And what I get is, you know, some poor dozing, you know, working breed go, what? Where did they out a control dog come from? I didn't see one in the room. They get very upset. So that arousal in your dog can trigger the other dog's attention. It can make him a target. It can also make him, um, whatchamacallit, it can make him more likely to make someone else a target. Because when they're aroused, they can also make bad choices, very much like 
like kids do. So it's not that arousal is bad, it's just that we want to keep it in productive limits. We want to keep it functional, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit here. All right. So this is what's happening. You've got three basic parts of your autonomic nervous system. And bear with me for a bit, because I'm going to come back to this. You don't need to memorize the science, but the sympathetic, this is about activation. This is about uh, mobilization. Uh, fight or flight, which is a very huge spectrum, and there's a lot that happens between the two. But if I wake you up and go, quick, 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 there's four dogs loose on the street, hurry. It's your sympathetic nervous system. Say, what? Do I need leashes? Should I get cookies? What should I get? You're all set. Exploration is also part of it, that in a new environment, when they invited you to explore this later, depends how much your parasympathetic is dragging you towards sleep, whether or not you'll take them up on it. And learning and performance. Does everyone remember college or high school where you thought, or maybe it's work, I don't know. I love what I do and I don't uh, tend to get bored at my work. But some people are like, oh my God, I sat through that meeting, I had to keep pinching myself. Stay awake, stay awake. Because you couldn't keep your arousal up enough. There was nothing stimulating about the meeting. So you began to slide this way towards parasympathetic. And these two work as a braking system. So as one comes high, the other one kicks in to try to bring you back into balance. It's not an on-off switch. And certain activities require parasympathetic. Anyone here ever laid awake at night thinking and 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 thinking, you know that one? Right. Apparently you're supposed to just get up and vacuum according to Martha Stewart, but I prefer to lay there and just think actually. I get more done that way. So this parasympathetic is about inhibition, it's about a conservation of energy. When animals um, are really afraid, they'll shut down. They'll begin to conserve their energy, not run around screaming. Freezing and faint are part of this part of the nervous system being heavily activated. And rest and digestion require it. So that if you've ever had that fun meal where you think, why did I even bother eating? because you feel like you just ate, you know, God knows what. See, it's after me. Everyone else heard that, right? I didn't hallucinate it. Okay. All right, so rest and digestion. We've all had that not been able to sleep gig, and we've all had that horrible feeling of butterflies, stomach, our digestion is really not doing well because we're so upset. It's, the, it's part of it is the sympathetic activation. So the same thing is true for our dogs. The part that I find really interesting and worth thinking about for dogs is the enteric nervous system. The nickname for this is the second brain. And they're beginning to do a lot more research about this. They now have neurogastroenterologists because this system actually has more nerves than the rest of your spine and peripheral nervous system combined. It produces at least 30 different neurotransmitters. 95% of the, the serotonin in, in the human brain anyway, exists in your gut. And your gut is from your, your mouth to your anus. It operates independently of this brain. It's a really interesting thing. But it has a lot to do with those butterflies in our stomach. It has a lot to do with the fact that the, the secretions from the enteric nervous system can potentiate through the whole body. This emotions they're beginning to believe don't originate here. When we say, I felt it in my gut, turns out we were not talking just um, metaphorically, that actually we're not wrong about that. We actually are feeling it there. So it's a particularly interesting aspect that 90% of nerves from the vagus, which is the big um, vein, uh, nerve that informs us, it goes from the gut to the brain. They used to think that this drove everything else. So they were quite stunned when they realized, no, the brain is being driven very often this way. So it's just something to keep in mind. About 50% of the dopamine is there in the gut. 95% of the serotonin. Serotonin, while it's known as you're happy, and it's also responsible for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So that when you have animals distressed, when you have long-standing anxiety, when you have these animals that are afraid, 
I'm sure what they're going to start to show is that there's a very strong correlation between what's happening in their gut and what's happening in their emotional system, that we need to get the whole animal healthy and strong. Next slide. All right, so this is Abraham Maslow. I'm determined to bring Maslow and his work back to the forefront of dog training. Maslow was a um, psychologist. He's very prominent in the 40s. And they were all looking at different models for how an animal expended his behavioral energy. The one that made tremendous sense to me the very first time I read it was this. And it's his hierarchy of needs. So it's this basic pyramid. And what he says is at the very bottom of this are these physiological needs. That literally the animal has to have enough food and in the right quantity with the right balance of nutrients. He has to have water. He can't be dying of thirst or excessively hydrated. And he needs to be in a state of homeostasis or balance throughout his body. If he's not, the majority, if not all of his behavior, will be devoted to meeting that need. So you, you try to think about animals that, this is how we capture some animals, right? Their need for food or water is so great that we can actually entice them into a situation they would avoid otherwise because they have to meet that need even if it puts them at risk. Um, I had a really great dinner a couple years ago with Mark Johnson, if you're not familiar with his feral dogs website. He does a lot of work in third world countries and spay neuter programs where they're, they're catching these dogs in the streets in India and their spay neuter clinic might be a corner courtyard where they have 25, 30 dogs that they've anesthetized, done surgery on, and, and these are very feral dogs. But what they're taking advantage of is this, this desperate need for food is so um, intense for these dogs that they'll, they'll do what they have to to meet that need. That's not true for most of our dogs. Most of our dogs actually have these needs excessively well met. They actually have padding. If they could send it to the starving dogs in India, most of them should do so. My mother used to say that, you know, if you don't finish that, there's children in Africa who would like that. And I'm like, well, then mail it to them. Because <laughs> I don't really like this. I just want to point that out. So we all understand this. And none of us would attempt to train a dog who was hungry or starving or had diarrhea or was sick or was too hot or too cold. We just wouldn't. What would we say? We need to let him, he needs to recover. He needs to relax. He needs to be in balance. Let's let him calm down. Next slide. So we don't tend to violate that, but dear God, this is where we fail dogs. Because the very next need, once those basic physiological needs have been met, the very next need is for safety. And this is where we fail them. And if there's nothing else you take away from this lecture tonight, please take away the concept of safety and some of the tips I'm going to give you on how to make sure your dog does feel safe. Because no matter how well fed he is, if he doesn't feel safe, the next big chunk of his behavior will be devoted to trying to feel safe. And that one we violate in ways big and small. Have you ever sat next to someone who just give you the creeps? I fly a lot, so I get to practice all kinds of <laughs> human interactions. And sometimes people sit next to me. I remember one guy, he was a big teddy bear, and I thought, oh, I was so tired. I don't know if I was on a red eye from, I don't know where I was, but I'd been on a plane a long time. And he was such a nice, kind man. I thought, you know, dude, if you were a puppy, we would just get into a puppy pile, and we would just curl up, and we would go to sleep. But I didn't actually say that to him because I, I thought he was going to ring for the stewardess. But I thought, you know, you seem like such a nice man. It would be more comfortable if we weren't trying to do this for the next 12 hours on this flight. We could just do what puppies and kittens have the sense to do, which is if it's safe to do so, make contact. <sighs> Most other passengers I've flown with, I, I had no desire to share a puppy pile with them at all. I once said that to someone, I'm like, do you think the world would be better if we had puppy piles? And they're like, I don't know, Suzanne, it could get worse or better. All depends on the puppies involved. <laughs> so, it's just a theory I have. But all of us know that feeling of being someplace where technically we're safe, and yet it's either conditional safety, or it's because someone we're with knows a little bit more. I had a great appreciation for this. My husband's a retired cop. And we were in downtown Chicago, not a nice section, you know, industrial and late at night and walking around. I don't remember why. 
And I was like, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm with a guy and a cop. That's as good as it gets. That's great. And all of a sudden, Mr. Cool Cop starts doing this. I'm like, we're going to die. <laughs> He's afraid. If he doesn't feel safe, what the hell? Oh, I, there's no hope for me. And in that moment, I had tremendous sympathy for the dog whose owner goes, <gasps> because she saw another dog coming down the street. Or, oh my God, here come those kids. I hope they don't touch my dog. Dog's like, uh-oh. We're all going to die, aren't we? Chicken Little was not just a book. <laughs> no, honey, he's real. Right. So this safety thing can be violated on a big way like that. It can be as simple as taking the dog and physically pulling him someplace he didn't care to be, holding or manipulating parts of his body he didn't agree to let you do, crowding him into spaces he doesn't feel safe. There's a lot of different ways we do it. Or saying, oh, sure, your kid can pet my dog. Did you ask the dog if he wanted to pet the kid? That's what I always ask. It's like, well, yay for the kid. My dog says not really interested, but thank you. <laughs> or sure, he can play with my dog. It's like, well, it's a, it's a mutual thing. It's not a, here's, it's not a ball that you just throw out there. So we violate this, and we also put dogs in situations where we may assess that they're safe, but they don't feel safe. You ever gone somewhere with someone, they're like, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine. You're like, I'm not feeling so fine about this right here. Oh, don't worry about it, it's good. I like my friend in Alaska, for example. It's good, it's just a 10-foot bear. <sighs> okay, next slide. So, I have what I call the elemental questions, and it'll probably be one of the next books I write. And there's six elemental questions. One of the most important of them is this. How is this for you? Because this is like treating your dog like he is one of your most cherished friends or your most beloved house guest ever. If you ask this question often, you cannot go very wrong with anyone, including your animals. How is this for you? If you've ever had a house guest and you think, are you okay? Too warm, too cold, would you like something to eat? Would you like more to drink? You're literally checking, how is this for you? You comfortable? No, I'm good. I'm good. We tend to be very sensitive in those, those weird moments where we have a house guest we have to take care of. Not so careful sometimes with those that we live with all the time. So I'm really big on asking a dog as a trainer in about, I don't know, literally seconds. It'll be seconds. This is the mantra in my head. How is this for you? If something changes that animal, why? How is it for you now, better or worse? What just happened to shift you? How is this for you? How is this for you? How is this for you? So it's not that I don't make mistakes as a trainer or a handler. Of course I do. It's just that this is so much a part of the mantra in my head, and it so drives what I do with every animal, that I rarely work on assumptions. I'm literally looking at minute by minute, second by second, how is this for you? And when you really listen to that answer, you'll know instantly when your dog says, it was okay, but then I say, that guy came through the door, and now I'm not so sure this is a good space for me to be in. Instantly, you'll know when that shift occurs. So I love this slide. This came off the internet. I love how all these dogs are showing, how is this for you? They're also showing, where do I feel safe? So I love the two adolescents over in the top corner. Like, yeah, we're just going to wait over here while the big guys get fed. They have such a goofball puppy look on their faces, don't they? Like, we're good. We're just watching from over here. Mm -hmm. My favorite is the little guy tucked behind his knee, though. He's like, how close can I get without it? That's why I had to put the arrow there. Nobody ever saw him. <laughs> I would talk about him. People would be, you know, like, what is she talking about? I was like, I better add an arrow then. And the thing that these dogs have to work out here is not only they've got the draw of the guy with what I assume is food. I doubt it's water, but it could be. Look on their face. I'm thinking it's food. They have to do a couple things. Balance themselves where they feel safe. So each one of them is answering this question of how is this for you? They're answering it in a different way. And they have to be careful who they annoy who's in the group. Who's allowed to step closer? Who could stand here? Everyone's chosen their space to answer this question, how is this for you in this moment? They're getting as close as they dare and they're showing us how they feel safe in this moment. When dogs are free to do so, 
They will usually choose very wisely to show us where they feel safe. They will go just so far and no further with the exception of when we use food or other toys or lures to push them across the spot where they said, this is as far as I go. And you said, yeah, but you know what? I've got cookies, which is one of the more obscene things we can say to a dog who has said, I don't feel safe for going any closer. That would be like Tammy saying, I'm not getting any closer to that cow. It's like, yeah, I have a big fat check. I could pay your mortgage. <laughs> That's not a fair equation. It's, it's called bribery and pressure and it's coercion. So for those who pride themselves on being humane trainers, be very careful that the coercion with food is never part of this equation. You really have to honor when the dog says, this is the edge of where I feel safe. Doesn't mean you don't help him learn skills past that, but you have to honor that and that's your starting point. All right, next slide. So for the dog, the safe zone is wherever he says it is. It's out there. Wherever you are over there and this is as close as I care to get to you, then everything back here is my safe zone. So if we just choose you guys in the front row, you might be on my critical zone if I was a dog, so that if you move one inch more, I have to make some decision. That's what that critical zone means. The dog's now pushed into, he's going to have to make a decision. A little further back, you're on my radar, I'm alert and I'm attentive. And on the, on the scale of arousal, the very first notch is alertness and attention. And we all know that, right? You can be kind of like dozing off and you hear a sound, you're like, what was that? As soon as you bring your head up, as soon as you question, huh? If you had ears, they go, whoo? Yeah. That's the beginning of arousal. The arousal then increases as the thing comes closer to the animal or intensifies. Flight or fight is a zone where the dog really does feel a tremendous amount of pressure and has to do something dramatic, leave or actually deal with it in some way. And it's not always about fight. Not always about fight. Sometimes it's about tend, tending and bonding. So some dogs will actually choose an affiliative response. But neither here nor there. So I always want to know where in any given situation is the dog defining what is safe, what is not so safe, and he will be right at the edge of it. Okay, next slide. So these are the disruptions that are common in safety. This little dog was found in a, in a ditch. This is my niece. Her friend's uh, mom had picked him up out of the ditch. And when I assessed this dog, I thought, you have a problem here because most anything interrupted his view of, of how he felt about life. He didn't like being restrained. He didn't like being carried. He didn't like being interrupted. He didn't like being touched. He didn't like, and he would back it up with his teeth. So I was like, uh, he ended up did bite somebody, but they found him a home. But the look on his face right here is like, seriously, if I was bigger, you would not be able to do this to me. So these are the things that will disrupt that feeling of safety. If, for example, God forbid, you know, one of those windows blew out back there. You guys are sitting here feeling fairly safe. Man, that would disrupt some of you. You would no longer feel safe in this room. You're like, I I'm going home. I don't know what made that thing go up, but I'm not, I don't feel safe here anymore. Some of you would be like, whoa, that was weird. Go right back to what you're doing. Restraint, handling, we've talked about inconsistency before. <clears throat> Unpredictability, also very important for the anxious dog. Illness, disease, or pain can also limit. You'll, you'll get a classic report from people with middle-aged dogs. Used to love to play with all the other dogs. Now he doesn't want to play anymore, or he started to growl at all the other dogs he sees. Check immediately. There's something going on. Do a physical. Maybe his hips are beginning to bother, maybe he's a little arthritic, maybe there's something else cooking in there. But that shift, he doesn't feel safe anymore. Anybody here ever had any vertigo or any balance disorder? I had my first bout of that, that was great fun. It's like, wow, hmm, can't even stand up, huh? I can, I can make it happen, I'm going to bull my way through it. Splat, and bleh. It was a really nice combo on the floor and throwing up. Charming, lovely. But man, you talk about not feeling safe even in my own bedroom. The, the concept that I had to like turn over or try to get down the stairs became a really scary process. So sometimes we forget when a dog doesn't feel in control of his own body, for whatever reason, it can be really terrifying. 
anyone has watched an old dog with vestibular disorder, you can tell someone like me with vestibular, stop fighting it, stupid. And they had to keep adding that last part. Stop fighting it, stupid. You can't say that to a dog. All they know is, I'm trying to stand up and my body doesn't work. It's terrifying. You don't feel safe when you don't know what to do, right? Remember when you were learning to drive? If any of you can remember that far back. Or maybe when you got your first dog or when you got your first food processor or your first blender and you didn't put the cap on. Again, ask how I know. And being conspicuous. Right here, you've all agreed this is a nice uh, setting and we're all safe and no one is patrolling the grounds with machine guns, so it's good to be here. But if I were to say to you, so if you have the color blue on, please stand up on your chair and begin singing happy birthday in Spanish. What? All right, just happy birthday in English, then. Yeah, no, just asking you to stand up or raise your hand or ask a question in a group this size will almost always make people feel so conspicuous they no longer feel safe. And yet no one here has demonstrated any homicidal tendencies, and please refrain from that till I've left the building. I would appreciate that. <clears throat> we have a homicide-free history, and I'm going to keep it that way. All right, so being conspicuous, how does that play out in the dog's world? Where might the dog become conspicuous? Training, where he's asked to come out, do stuff. Performance, where you think it's just great, where he's at a pet show and everybody's going to show up their best tricks and he's like, Mom, I don't do that out in public. I, you know how you sing in the shower? Mm-hmm, you know, ixnay on the paw thing. Mm-hmm. Great. Because I'm betting a bunch of you sing in the shower like crazy and you're wailing in your car. Yeah, that's right. I should be an American Idol. Uh huh. And if I say, well, come on up. In this size group, there's probably one or two who are like, all right, what song do you want? There's always a wannabe. But most of you are like, no, we're good. We're good. No need to stand up there and do that thing. We forget that, though that we ask our dogs to do stuff. We're like, come on, you know these people. It's a good place. You've been here before. He goes, it has nothing to do with that. They're all looking at me. (laughs) And the other problem with performing in front of other dogs is that dogs are predators. So I was watching at a horse show one day, and this horse is zipping around, and he's doing a very nice job. There's several other horses standing there at ringside, like, oh, I say, well done. Yes, uh, Raba. You were waiting for them to start golf clapping or something. And then I I compared that to what it looks like when dogs are watching other dogs. (laughs) This would be like, you know, asking Tammy to get up and show us her best dancing routine. And meanwhile, we all have like laser sights on our chest, you know, little red dots. It's like, whoa, they're not watching with a well done. They're like, it's very exciting when you run like that. I love that. Run faster. And then the herding breeds are like, yes, you're beginning to look like a sheep. (laughs) The terriers are saying, my god, you look just like a rat. (laughs) And the less brave dogs are gone. (laughs) They slow down on the course and go, I'm just going to whistle past this graveyard because do you see what's happening here? They're all staring at me. So it can be as simple as just being made conspicuous and not having the confidence or the skills to be handling that. All right, next slide. All right, when the dog's in a safe zone, never forget that this is momentary, that he is in balance, and he is both physically and emotionally in balance. And it's one thing I actually look for when I'm dealing with these dogs, is I want to see, does he stand up on all fours, and what does his balance do? Because long before the dog actually takes a step backwards away from something he finds um, worrisome, he'll actually lean back. He'll keep his center of gravity back here. So if I get a dog who even so much as leans back an inch from me, then I know I've already pressured him. I've already gone there. So this is why I probably still have 10 fingers at this point in my career, only because I watch at that level. So he can be here. He just pulls his head in a little bit, and I think that says he had, to, he had to give that space. He was feeling that pressure. So look for shifts of balance, 
slight compression, and look for even in the micro spaces here where it's just a matter of an inch, half an inch. The dog pulls away, trust it, and believe it. He's telling you something about he's, how he's feeling in that situation. So it's momentary. Eh, almost anything can change it. Sounds, people coming, people going, dogs arriving, smells, you name it. The same thing that could change safety for you can change it for them. And they are privy to things we're not. They hear and see things differently than we do, and they certainly have a much richer world of scent. Next slide. So here's what I want you to think about. Those of you who are in the, the mental health field will recognize the global assessment of function. This is what's done for people, and it's very carefully scaled, and it's scaled on these aspects. Um, is the person able to eat, drink, sleep? Are they able to take care of themselves, personal hygiene? Are they social? Are they able to maintain relationships? Are they able to work or learn and play? The degree to which any of these are affected begins to drive what's going to happen in terms of the support needed for that person. So you can say, you know, Bob, well, he, he overeats. He does overeat, but you know, when we say drinking with animals, we don't usually mean beers. <clears throat> you know, sleeping, yeah, he, he's all right. He has a couple nights a week, he has a lot of trouble sleeping. Sometimes Bob forgets to take a shower. You know, we have to remind him Dude, wash your clothes, take a shower. Um, socially, he has a couple of friends, but he tends to alienate people, and Bob has a hard time holding on to a job. We start to understand and forget play. He doesn't have any friends or a social network where play is even possible. So this is what I'm asking too, because now we start to see that's the profile of someone who needs some help. He's, he's not functioning well. So one of the scales that I use for the anxious dog is what I ask the person is, on these points, show me the dog at home, and show me the dog in the situation you, you were asking about and wish him to handle. So when people say, well, whenever I take him out on the road, he doesn't eat, he doesn't really drink much, I have to force feed him, and then when we get home from a trial weekend, you know, he sleeps for three days. He's telling you that what you've asked him to do is way past his capacity because he's become dysfunctional in the face of it. Can you imagine some grandmother telling you, well, I took the kid to Disney World. We had a great time. Tommy wouldn't eat anything, so every night his mother and I made balls of grilled cheese. We put it down his mouth, said, you're going to eat. He didn't poop till we got home. He was a little cranky. He was a little cranky, but we had lovely ice cream and the seafood. Ah, it's delicious. We had a great time. You're like, hey, Grandma, which? Which part of fun for the kid, didn't you? Oh, he was also very scared. He saw Snow White, he wet his pants. <laughs> All right then, so does that actually define a fun weekend for little Tommy? It doesn't. But dog people think nothing of saying, well, he never eats when I take him out. Or at home, he's very playful, but he won't play when he's out. Play only occurs in safety. I could pick the game you love most, and I bet Somebody could steer me to some neighborhoods in Pittsburgh where if we went out there tonight around midnight, one, two o'clock, I'd be like, let's do it. Let's play some Scrabble, slap down those tiles, let's go. You're like, yeah, no thank you, actually. Um, no thank you. Um, no, we're good. We're good. No, no desire to play Scrabble here. But you love this game. So the degree to which your dog shows you his function, his normal healthy functions, these are all what happens when an animal is in balance, and he can cope with the scenario. The degree to which it's dis disturbed by a given environment, scenario, or task, is something you have to take into account. And in any shelter setting, this is always of great concern to them. There's nothing sadder than a cat who says, I am so depressed, I am so upset, I will not groom myself. This is a sign of severe depression in a cat, or illness, or both. So an animal who says, I don't care, or an animal who just refuses to have normal interactions or who can't sleep. Animals have the same problem with sleep disruption that we do. It is not good for them. So consider this and say, you know what? Here's little Bozo at home and he plays and he does this and he's, you know, the people that come to the house, he loves them, he's great. I can teach him all tricks and I take him out to the, the training class. He sits there and shakes and he can't eat. Hmm. 
have to wonder about whether or not that's a, a good scenario for him. You know, the vet we can't avoid, but there's many other places we can take the dog that we may need to avoid, but we need to put it on this kind of a scale so we understand truly how functional is he. All right, next slide. So the number of functions that are affected is what matters to me. I want to know about the intensity of that disruption. I want to know how long does it take this dog to recover. I have literally seen dogs walk out of a training room and go like, Bleh. well, all right, now that that horrible thing's over. All right, then. And the sad part is I had a woman who wanted to bring a dog. It was, it was this same topic, but a two-day workshop, hands-on with dogs. And the question was asked, what would it take? You know, what are the things that provoke your dog? When that happens, what does he do? And then the, the most telling question, how long once he's been triggered until that dog returns to normal? And I'm not exaggerating. One woman said, well, the first time we took him to the hotel room, he dove under the bed and wouldn't come out. We had to dissemble the bed around him. And we persisted in taking him to this five-day holistic, you know, good for him seminar. And every morning we had to dissemble the bed. And I thought, at what point would you not go home? It just broke my heart. And then she wanted to put him in a seminar setting. I'm like, you can't. Or he's usually OK within three or four hours. This is a very prolonged recovery period. This points to how severe this toll it is on the dog. And the escalation of dysfunction, that the dog was OK here, and now he's a little worse. And the next time you take him there, he's worse. And the next time you take him there, he's worse. He's becoming sensitized to this now. It's already becoming a trigger that he just knows you've driven into this place, and <gasps> it starts. So the anticipation can set off anxiety. And of course, we all get very anxious. I go, <laughs> I can do that. Most people are like, oh, man, that sounds like a dentist drill. It's like, yes, it does. There's no guy in a white coat. There's not that weird little smell. But <laughs> do it. People go, mm. get a little creepy. So hopefully, make sense? It's just a way to understand where is that dog at and, and back to that question. How is this for you? How is this for you? And how are you over here? And if you're better over here, then I got to be very careful about where I take you. Still always asking, how is this for you? All right, next slide, please. So for resolutions, what are we going to do with these dogs? We have them. We love them. It doesn't mean that they're not valuable companions, entertaining, great teachers. They can be really wonderful animals. However, we have to be aware that we've got some resolutions. So my approach is this. I'm really interested in providing the dog with support. And that comes in a number of, of ways that we will talk about. Protection. He doesn't drive a car ever, unless he's a border collie, in which case you know, <laughs> there is that exemption in New York state law. <sighs> Protection from the stuff that he didn't sign up for, he didn't volunteer for, he doesn't even know what he agreed to. And you're like, do you want to go? And he goes, yeah. Oh, I, I didn't know this is where we were going. Had I had fully informed consent, you know, meanwhile, he's trying to call his lawyer going, I, seriously, that was not in the contract. I want to give these dogs skills. And I'm really big on this one. How many skills? We're going to talk about that. And then overall, most of all, for any animal in my care, and especially animals that have issues that are fearful or shy or anxious, we owe them the freedom from distress. None of us would sit by while the dog was bleeding or limping or had a physical issue that could be addressed. We would seek help, we would seek mediation, we would do what it took to help relieve that physical suffering. And yet, oddly, I find people are willing to push dogs into emotional distress and not see it as such. And yet the dogs are the ones that pay the price. So for me, freedom from emotional, mental, and physical distress is, that should be a given to the degree we can handle and provide that for our dogs. OK. So support, here we go. People go, well, what happens if you comfort the dog who's afraid? Aren't you just reinforcing the fear? It's one of my favorite topics. It's like, no. No more than your mother's made you Fruit Loops by giving you a hug when, when you were afraid. 
And never mind human mothers, because that's a strange uh, bottle to open anyway, and the genie will never go back in the bottle. Animal mothers. I've yet to see too many animal mothers of social animals that say, you know what, suck it up, kid. Get out there and deal with it. They don't. You watch an animal that says, ah, I'm afraid. The mother shows up. If it's a mother who takes care of her young, she shows up and she offers contact in some way. It's very interesting watching the bison out at Wolf Park because when the wolves show up, you'll get some calves who are like, nee, 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 nee. uh-oh. <laughs> you know? They run back and the moms will put them right under that great big shaggy head of theirs. They tuck them right under their neck. They're like, come here, Mr. Wolf. You want to talk to me about my kid? I don't think so. It's really interesting to watch our, our cattle do this. And when a piglet screams, it's like pig 911. <laughs> Every ounce of pork flesh on the farm is like, then someone's got the children wrong. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And you so do not want to be on the receiving end of Mama Pig who thinks you have upset one of her babies. I have been. Wasn't funny. <laughs> so there's a little tiny grain of truth in that very, very horrible notion that if you comfort an animal who's afraid, he will become more afraid. If that is the only reinforcement and positive interaction this animal gets from you is the only time you're really attentive and caring for him is when he's afraid, guess what? It's like the kid who gets only negative attention by smashing in the neighbor's windows, but at least somebody paid attention to him because it's set in the context of a dysfunctional relationship. Within the context of a functional relationship, you will not increase their fear as long as you're not doing this. It's okay, mommy says, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, really, imagine if, you know, someone were to show up and go, the building is on fire, there's no need to panic, there's no need to panic, there's no need to panic. Um, you're going to panic, that's it, sure. Someone says, you know what, folks, we have a little issue here, if you could just calmly walk out the nearest exit. So there's a notion there that how we provide that comfort can either be comforting or it can be putting gasoline on the lit fire. Ever had anyone comfort you when you were afraid? And I mean, it really helped. The hallmarks are this, they're calm, they're steady, and their touch tends to be quiet. They're not desperately patting you or stroking you. It's okay, honey, it's okay, it's okay. Like, stop doing that, I have enough problems. Now you're rubbing me bald. <laughs> The ones that I love most are the ones that just have steady contact, which says, literally, I'm here and I've got your back. So for all of my animals, whether that's a cow, a horse, a pig, a cat, it doesn't matter, a bird, whatever's in my hands, that is the contact they get. So when my puppies are growing up and they're not sure and they're like, <gasps> and I think, dude, I got your back. So it's a quiet, calming contact. I'll often have my hands still on their chest I might back them up so they're literally against my legs. I gotcha. Let's just sit here quietly and watch this. My breathing is calm. My touch is, is it's firm and it's clear, but I'm not holding them. I'm not restraining them. It's just this contact. My breathing stays normal. My voice is nice and quiet. It's all right, pal. Let's watch this. It's okay. Not, <laughs> doesn't help. Does that make sense? When I have people sitting next to me that are white knuckle flyers for my own protection, I tend to calm them down. They're like, oh my God, I'm nervous, let me for what is that noise? So if I were a dog trainer, I'd say, well, I'm not gonna reinforce that fear. Suck it up, messy. <laughs> oh my God, I have to sit next to her for the whole flight. It's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. So instead, you know, I don't do a lot of calming contact with a hand on her chest or anything, <laughs> but, he is really handsome, I might have to go there. <laughs> Mostly, I just talk and I might put my hand on their hands like, it's okay, you know what? I fly a lot, so that's the noise. I know it sounds like they're assembling the plane down there. It's normal in an Airbus, we don't know why. <sighs> and get them through it, the same way you would want someone to reassure you. So I also wanna talk about this notion, if dog trainers, if you hold a dog trainer, that you're cold, they would give you, I don't know, let's say they give you a coat. 
And they said, okay, you warm now? It's like, no, no, I'm still cold. And they're like, fine, well, I guess coats don't work. They would take it away. And then this is, leads to trainers and handlers saying, well, I've tried everything. And when I asked them, it was like they gave you a coat and you were still cold, so they got rid of that. And then they went and tried a hat. <sighs> She's still cold. Hats don't work. Mittens don't work. Scarves don't work. All together, they work. So we would understand, and I want you to take that concept home of behavioral layers where skills and management and support in a smaller world and calming, comforting contact, we start to put all these together. Now we have a package where that animal feels better all together. But don't be quick to dismiss something and get rid of it and say it doesn't work. See what other layers you might be able to add that make it really helpful. Because most of what I do with clients that I work with, it is layers. It's not, do this one thing and he'll be better. Just like most people don't just put a coat on and feel okay. All right, next. So this is, this is uh, Rain with one of her puppies. And I really love this quote from, from the same guy who wrote The Little Prince, which is, we are responsible forever for what we have tamed. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You don't take animals places that they can't handle. You protect them from the crazy ass human world. You take them out in it to the degree that they can handle it. But we're talking about shy and anxious and fearful dogs. They're already telling you, I have some special needs here. I need extra protection. The dogs that sail out in the world and go, wow, cool. Let's see what happens next. They still deserve protection, but they don't need as much. You understand the difference? We've tamed them. We're responsible forever what happens to them. All right, next. So here's what I like to do in terms of resolutions, skill development, management, desensitization, counter conditioning, flooding, medication. We're going to talk about each of these in some detail now. All right, next. So management. Here's the positives of management. You avoid the triggers. If men in uniforms really scare this dog, well, then I'm just going to avoid men in uniforms. Easy enough. I don't have to go out and, and present my dog with the UPS man, unless I happen to work at UPS, I guess. It can give the dog a much smaller world. When we manage things so that we avoid these triggers, the dog's world shrinks. I'm not going to take him to PetSmart anymore. He finds it too scary with the carts and the people and the other dogs and the kids, and it's just chaos. He can't handle it. I'm not going to take him to the pet parade. That was just too much for him. So managing that gives him a smaller world. And very often, a smaller world is much more um, acceptable to the dog, and it's something he can cope with. I have many friends who are horrified by the fact that I get on planes and fly all over the place, and I have no idea where I'm going half the time or what crazy person is going to pick me up this time. And I once went all the way to Tokyo and got there and realized I don't actually have contact info. I'm literally standing in the Tokyo airport going, well, his first name is... <laughs> and my friends are like, how do you do that? Are you insane? I was like, well, I figured they'd come and get me. And it turns out they were late for about 45 minutes because of some train problem. So I'm like, hmm. I actually hadn't touched base within a few weeks. I don't know if they're coming for me or not. But I thought, eh, they're not here by... It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're not here by 9 p.m. to take my Amex card. I'm going to get a taxi. I'm going to a hotel. Somebody will come look for me, or I'll fly home, whatever. My friends are like, how can you do that? They don't like to go out if they don't know like, if that restaurant really is open. Never mind fly to Tokyo without contact info. So I, I deal well with the bigger world, but for my friends, it would be so anxiety producing that a smaller world where they only occasionally step out of their comfort zone is actually the kindest thing. They're happiest there. So don't think that a smaller world means a deprived world. If someone were to come up to some of you guys and go, you've got to go on a cruise every three months. You have got to join this bowling league. You have got to get together on Friday nights, game night in our house. You're going to love it. Oh, and there's cocktail parties every other night. Come on. That's exactly the look you have on your faces right now. Like, you're going to leave the next morning and leave no forwarding address. Uh, uh, no, we're good. Thanks, though. We don't think of it, but we all make the world the size that we can handle. So we have to ask the dogs, what's the size world you can handle? And this is one of the positives of management. We can shrink the world to a size where they're like, 
I can handle this size. I can handle this size world. Quality of life issues become important. The dog is really freaked out by being out in the world. You owe him the quality of life that says, I go around my block, I hang out in my backyard, I play with my doggy pals or my family, I'm good. No need to push it. Next. Here's the downside. First of all, management ultimately always forever bet your life on it fails. No one can manage anything 100% of the time. I have two dogs that really don't like each other. So when I let the dogs out of the crates in the bedroom in the, in the morning, I let this pair out and then I come back and get that pair. So what do I do? This is what I do for a living, mind you. I get well paid to be really good at what I do. I open crate number one with dog number one who hates dog number two, and I open dog number two's crate, and I'm like, huh. Even as I did it, my brain's going, probably not one of your better choices. <laughs> All right, fat girl, start hoofing it down the stairs, because of course they're much faster, and I can hear them, vroom, they've both gone into the kitchen, and they're both so surprised, they're like, what are you doing here? Yeah, what are you doing? No, what are you doing? And they're having that conversation of, what? They were so shocked, I would be like, hey. And they're like, well, yeah. I was like, Phew. And this is my mantra, as I'm splitting them up and we don't have a fight and all as well. It's like, yes, management always fails. Management always fails. Management always fails. Management always fails. Trust it. So if you think that by locking this door, having this crate, having this door shut, everyone in the neighborhood knows, no one will ever do this, that that will always be padlocked, I will never allow that to happen. Get real and have a management plan that includes what happens when management fails, because it will. It will. That means double doors. That means double checks. That means things that are harder to do. That means what are we going to do when management fails? So if it happens where management fails and it all comes back in your head, I don't care too much. I care a lot when management fails the dog and he's put in a situation. I was just talking to a young trainer and one of the dogs she had was so fearful, so anxious. She did her very best with him, but by the time he was 16 months old, he panicked, got out of the door, ran out of the street and got killed. Well, I can manage it, I can manage it, I can manage it. You can only manage it so far and you won't manage past anxiety or fear. Those can really push a dog into a very dangerous situation. So be very, very aware of this. I couldn't tell you how many competitive handlers I've talked to. Well, I know he's really afraid of crowds, and I know he's really weird about this when the loudspeakers go off, but I can manage him, and as long as he's out there on the agility course, he's good. It's like, really? Do you want to talk about the dog who got spooked by a sound and ran out and got killed? I mean, this is not uncommon, because they thought they could manage it, and as long as the dog was doing what he loved, it wouldn't come into play. Be aware that this, remember that safety thing? That will win. That will win the day for these dogs. They will do what they have to do to get themselves someplace safe. So it may also leave the dog at serious risk. I know how to manage the crazy dogs in my household. I know that Rain and Ruby both believe they should be the princess of the world. Ruby's wondering where her crown is and why it's not back from the jewelers yet. Rain is wearing it going, well, that's because I'm the queen, you silly bitch. It goes around like that. If I did not take care to make sure that many people knew, number one, what were the acceptable pairings? It's on my refrigerator. Every single person that would be called in an emergency knows what's what. Because otherwise, we may leave the dog at serious risk. It's okay. As long as I'm there, he's good. Well, then God forbid and God bless and God speed, may you never be in an accident or sick or incapacitated or able to be there for that dog. So be very, very careful. Make sure this dog has some backup people. You cannot be the whole world for a dog without putting him at very grave risk. And my biggest problem with management is the dog doesn't learn a darn thing. So when he actually confronts the thing that provoked the fear or the anxiety, he has the same skill set he had to start with, which is to say, he doesn't. So those are the pluses and negatives of management. All right, is that a cute puppy or what? Seriously. 
Well, if my arousal was dropping, it's up now. I love a good shot of adrenaline in the morning. All right. Whew. This doesn't go with us tomorrow, right? Okay, good. What? That's a smaller group. I'm just going to yell. I'm just, just going to yell all day because I can't do this. All right. So the other re um, commonly recommended resolutions for these dogs are desensitization and counter conditioning. And they're almost always referred to together. And you'll see them as DC. I'm sorry, DS slash CC. So that's dog trainer lingo for desensitization and counter conditioning. Desensitization and counter conditioning are not synonymous. Desensitization says that I'm going to present something to you at such a low level that I say, look, you know, there's a little spider in my hand. It's very gradual, and I begin to desensitize you to that trigger. It begins to take more and more to produce the same response. Counter conditioning says, I know you hate Bob, here comes Bob, but you know what? Another five bucks, a back rub, some fresh coffee and Belgian chocolates. Bye, Bob. Oh, here comes Bob again, another five bucks, back rub, back. Yeah, pretty soon you're like, so where's Bob? <laughs> Counter conditioning says, I'm going to start to pair this thing that you find upsetting or alarming, and I'm going to pair it with something you really like in the attempt to make you feel differently about it. Here's the problem with both of them. They don't teach any skills. They just shift the emotional state. Once you shift the emotional state, then you have a different animal to deal with. When people are doing this, I get this all the time. I say, we say we've been working on desensitization counter conditioning. And I say, all right, how long have you been working on that? And they say, oh, six months. And I think you're doing it wrong. Because if you put the animal in a position where he feels safe, it goes very fast. I mean, it goes very fast. If you continue to put the animal in a situation where he does not feel safe and you attempt to counter condition or desensitize, guess what happens? Not much. Because foremost in that dog's head is that's too close, that's too much, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, I gotta get safe. So this is why you'll see like the open bar technique where you know, children just say he's bothered by children on bicycles. Here they come and you just feed them and feed them and feed them no matter what they're doing. Hmm, not always very effective and that's why we violated that safety. So when I do it, I'm finding the edge of how is this for you? And right where the dog goes, you know, it was okay and now it's starting to not. I'm like right there on that edge, right there. Can we start to think about that? And then we start to play with what's called the stimulus gradient. What's the duration of the presentation? So if I say, you know, there's a spider here, is that okay? You're like, yeah, I could bear that. And I have two spiders, that's more intensity, but very, very short duration. And I have a longer presentation, and I bring them closer to you. So it's distance, duration, intensity. If you can manage those for the fearful or anxious dog, and you pay attention to that question of, how is this for you? You'll go really far, really fast. It allows you to make really thin slices, and you keep asking the dog, how is this for you? How is this for you? If you don't feel safe, where are you safe? What does it take to make you safe? So, <clears throat> flooding, currently very popularized on TV by a trainer who shall remain nameless, where whatever the problem is with the dog, you just simply shove them, drag them, you just make them deal with it, and they'll be fine. The problem is flooding, number one, has great potential to be inhumane, because number one, it completely and utterly disregards the dog's feelings. It's the sink or swim, throw you off the dock, maybe you'll drown, maybe you'll learn to swim. It's not an approach I particularly like, and it's not one I use with animals. It's certainly popular because it gives the appearance of a quick fix. Well, just make him get used to it. I think if, well, if that were all it took, then all of us could be done with all of our fears because someone could just lock us in a box with a big spider or a big snake or whatever it was we were afraid of, and by gum by golly, we'd walk out of there going, you know what? I'm fixed. I have been whispered. <laughs> it can backfire badly. It can backfire very badly.
that will hopefully keep me from being sued. <laughs> it can backfire so badly that it can leave the dog hypersensitized, even worse than before. Flooding is just not one of my favorite techniques. It's, it's probably the thing I wouldn't even choose ever. I just wouldn't. All right, next slide. Medication, this one gets into a tricky area. I'm not a vet, I'm not pretending to be a vet. I don't play a vet on TV. I'm telling you what I would do if it were my dog. Number one, medication may offer the animal relief from emotional or mental distress. Anyone here, this is a big enough group, there's a percentage of you who are sitting here tonight because you're on medication, because your life was made possible because medication actually helped you that you actually have a family life and you are able to function because of it and you know right to the core of your bones the degree of distress. It was somewhere back in the, I don't know, mid 80s when I began talking about biochemical disorders in dogs and people thought I was crazy. And I grew up with a biochemical mom. I grew up with a mom who's been on every psychotropic dog, uh, drug you can think of and watch what happened when it was wrong, watch what happened when she was out of balance. So I have tremendous sensitivity to it, and I have great empathy for these dogs, because without help, some of them can't actually get out of their own way. Not all dogs. The quality of life, it comes down to that this may be the most humane approach is for this dog, even though there may be side effects. None of these drugs are innocuous. There may be a point where the quality of life, a slightly shorter life that's lived with quality and enjoyment beats a long life of misery any day of the week. The side effects are one of the things that get people. Well, it's not natural, they say. The things that are going on in the nervous system and those hormones that are being produced and those stress hormones and those neurotransmitters, yeah, they're, they're also natural, just so you know and they do some really nasty things to the immune system. They do some really terrible things to the animal's ability to learn, repair cell tissue, function, think, right down to you know, the tension in their veins and their arteries, which is not what you intend. So be very careful. Life has side effects too, and sometimes they're as bad or maybe even worse. And the biggest problem I see is that there's a lot of resistance from owners. Owners will not think anything of buying a new piece of equipment or a new head halter or I saw this new walkies leash that'll make your dog, you know, walk four inches off the ground so it's easier to control hovercraft than grounded vehicles. If I could make that up, man, people would be like, yeah, that's right. It is easier to influence a hovercraft. I don't know why. I could probably sell that to dog owners. But one lady told me this. She goes, I took medication and I didn't feel natural and it didn't feel real and I knew I was happier but I was only fake happy, so I don't want my dog to have that feeling. <laughs> the resistance by owners to this is really hard for me to understand, and I realize that this society is just catching on to the fact that mental health is as big a deal as physical health, that it's, it's ceasing to carry the stigma that it has for a long time, yet oddly for our pets, if your dog needs to be on, on psychotropic medication, um, Somehow it's like we created him that way. It's, don't, don't go there. If the dog needs the help, give him the help. All right. How do you know if medication's necessary? So long ago I came up with this little quick and dirty that I called the three Ps. I'm looking at <clears throat> what is the provocation, what's the proportion of response, and then what is the persistence of the response. So let's say I make this noise. Most of you, you registered it, but let's say you stood up and went, <gasps> I think, you know, that's a pretty small provocation, and I got a very big disproportionate response. I still wouldn't be saying that she needed medication unless she still several minutes later, <sighs> you're going to do that again? So when you look at this little graph, the green line in the bottom there, it's normal. There's some provoking stimulus, so you'll get a spike of response in the animal, and it drops off a bit, and there's a plateau phase, and then there's a satiation of the drop-off phase. And those should be, oh, okay, as your body and your brain resolve what that thing was. The dogs that I will refer to veterinary behaviors are the ones that have a disproportionate response, and on top of that, 
They have a prolonged recovery period. They're saying, I'm stuck in a biochemical loop I cannot get out of. I mean, this could be something, I had a little, uh, the wind just kind of blew through the, the chimney and the fireplace in the, the place I used for training. And two dogs were in the room, five, four people, four people. And the one dog kind of went like, what? And made like a whoosh. And he's like, huh? Oh, okay. He settled. The other dog leaped to her feet. <gasps> Five minutes later, she's still standing there staring at this. Her pupils are like this. She's heaving. She's panting. She's bug-eyed. She's, you know, the slightest touch or noise, she's, she's doing this. My recommendation was, this is an abnormal response and a very prolonged period. What happens at home? Oh, it can take her quite a long time before she can settle down again. So this dog is now being hijacked by her own neurotransmitters. She's, she's stuck in this loop where she cannot recover. And that whole time, she's, we just see her breathing and bug-eyed. She's actually feeling the racing heart. She's feeling her stomach clench. She's feeling all those horrible things you feel when you're, when you're startled and scared and you remain anxious. So this is where, just keep that in mind, these three Ps. It's a useful little thing, and that's when I will send someone off to a veterinary behaviorist. All right. So, really big on skills and training. I'm always asking the dog, not only how is this for you, but I think, what is it you need to know that if you knew how to do X, Y, or Z, you could handle this better? You would be able to cope with this. When we first bought cattle, my husband had no experience with cattle, so he would get a little frantic at times. He's like, well, I don't know what to do. I was like, well, then we'll teach you what to do. And now he's quite confident with the cows. In fact, he's, he's really good with them. He's really great with the pigs. But at first, he really was very frustrated and anxious because what does it mean when they do that? And I don't know how to do this. But as we developed his skills, it stopped being a point of anxiety. So for the anxious dog, making a list of the skills they need that enable them to cope with their life, primo, worth its weight in gold worth its weight in gold. So it's like, do you know how to approach people? And do you know how to walk away from people? And do you know how to do it voluntarily? I have to identify what are the things that are making the dog anxious? Do you know what to do when people on bicycles go by? Do you know what to do when we meet people on the trail? What to do when people come over to the house, when the doorbell rings, when the UPS man comes? Only you can make a list for your dog of the situations where when you say, how is this for you? He's like, right now? Not so good. What was it that set you off, dude? So it could be as simple as, we need to teach this dog what to do when the doorbell rings because he gets himself all bent out of shape when people come over or when he hears the neighbors or, or, or. Now once you identify the trigger, then you can say, what are the skills that we can actually use? So I'm huge on this. What are the skills I can give so that it stops being a trigger? If I can take the triggers out of the dog's life, that much less is provoking the anxiety. So here's the key points of one of the main techniques that I use. It's called treat retreat. I was inspired many years ago by Dunbar, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Although apparently at this point I've gone one way and he went another way with it, and it's not they don't even resemble the same uh, gig anymore. And he has it backwards. He has retreat treat. <laughs> Ian, seriously, throw the treat, then go away. So the key points to this are it's dog driven, meaning the dog sets the pace, the dog sets the edge of what's safe, the dog says when he is or is not done, pretty much. There's great autonomy for the dog, meaning that he is free to choose. And I really respect the choices that he makes. Safety, I will not violate the safety for the dog. The dog says he feels unsafe, I'll change the situation some way, somehow. And then ultimately there's respect for the fact that the dog can only learn what he can learn in that session, no matter what the owner wants or what my goals might be. And there's great respect for every communication he gives me, whether it's what I had in mind or not. I had one class I ran of this and I had said, the dog has to be able to eat treats with a stranger standing, you know, 25 to 50 feet away. They must be able to eat under duress. So what do I get in class number one? A catatonic border collie, only his eyes moved. It was like, I can't, I, I can't eat. 
a Weimaraner who tried to become part of the wall, an English shepherd who simply hid behind his owner and went, oh my God, oh my God, we're all gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna, die, we're gonna you know. It's like, huh, can any of these dogs eat? No. And I thought, well, it's gonna be a very special class. <laughs> it kinda hinges on that happening. And I remember a fellow trainer, he looks at me, he's like, you know, I could see him saying like, so yeah, now smart pants, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I don't really know, Joe, but we'll work something out, won't we? <sighs> this is one of the longest hour and a half classes of my life. And many of the dogs, actually, you'll see here, went on to do fine, but dear God, <laughs> I really had to say, even if it means um, I have to write refunds to every one of these owners, because I really can't help their dogs in this setting, I would have done that. I just wouldn't push the dogs. All right, next slide, please. All right, so treat retreat progressions. This is not a treat retreat workshop. This is not a how-to. I'm going to give you a feel for what this is. There's two ways that I do treat retreat. One is standing and in motion, and one is a seated, what I call an in and out approach. These are the basics that build the whole thing, and we will be working on a video and a book to go with this. So number one is an approach. The hardest thing for dogs to learn how to do is to voluntarily and in safety approach a stranger. I just want to make it really clear, I am not a fan of what I call go kiss grandma dog style, which means you teach the dog a target with a clicker, and then you make a human a target, and you say go touch that person. That is the equivalent of go kiss grandma. She stinks, and she's going to pinch me. <laughs> I don't want to kiss grandma. I'll give you five bucks, go kiss grandma. Remember we practiced this? Yes. <laughs> So I will never do that because now we've stripped the autonomy out of it, we've put a trained behavior and we've put into it an interaction the dog would not have chosen on his own. So me personally, you will never see me use a human as a target unless that dog loves that human and has no fear about approaching them. Never use something the dog's afraid of as a target. So the approach is the foundation for everything I do and duration has to be necessary. I don't want the dog coming in and zooming back out. I need him to learn how to be comfortable in the presence of people for a prolonged period of time. I don't mean like hours, but not that it's an in and out. It's, it's, not a, it's not a ricochet. So in the group, we start with, um, we do it two ways. Assisted meaning that the handler goes with the dog. The dog is almost always off leash. Um, the group is sitting in a circle, and then we have them kneeling, then we have them kind of standing, then we have them moving, then they're in groups and then say hi is much more directed. When the dog becomes a lunatic and he's like, hi, we're bothering, he's making his own rounds, having his own party, then we say, you know, there are a few rules about this meeting people thing. So I might say, go say hi, but not to him. Say hi to her, but not to her, not to her, to him, to him, there you go. And the dog's like, okay, so the dog learns to wait now to put this skill to use in, in a way that you can control. But that's the last thing we add. Contact. It's can you put your chin on my hand? And the equation is this. Can you, dog, make contact with me? Not may I make contact with you? Those are utterly different equations and the dog understands the difference brilliantly. So I use, often use the back of the hand. So I'll put the hand out here and I have it. The dog's already approaching, has a built duration here. And I'll say, can you put your chin on my hand? So there's a treat, and as soon as the treat's taken, the hand goes away. Then you get the dog, so he's pushing more, then I go down his throat, and I go for his chest. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm asking the dog, can you make contact with your body? Because he's always free to withdraw. And I'll show you a little bit of that in video. I want to know then about the hand over the head, and sometimes I start way up here. So are you okay with this? Are you okay with this? Are you okay with this? Till ultimately what I want is the dog very willing to make pressured contact. Just did this uh, about a month ago up in Connecticut with a Sheltie who really wanted, you know, she stayed three feet out from everyone. And what I could see was she liked people, but she did not know how to interact with strangers. So it only took, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. And pretty soon, you know, she's ducking and pushing my hand. Her choice, her choice. And that's the difference. She felt safe because she did have the choice to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. 
hand on the side, and then body contact with people can get really interesting. We'll sometimes have put people this far away from a wall and ask the dog to go behind them or under their legs or climb over them, and little dogs will actually get them walking up and down the person's body or using them as cavaletti and little jumps, and it can get really entertaining. You know, I've, there's had times when I've had little dogs on my chest and I think I'm getting too old for this because now I'm trying to like watch the dog and give them treats and then I have to like get up again. It's like, it's a whole new workout program. <laughs> Who needs to join curves? Just get some big dogs. You're good. In and out is a seated variation and I like this one because if you can get guests who can sit still and you can say, hey Bob, so I'm going to give you some cheese cubes. So when Buster comes in, see how he stands right at the edge of that room? Good, throw one to him. Good, throw another one back into the kitchen. Good for you, Bob. Throw it towards the flower pot. Yay for you, Bob. Really, kids, you can put out hula hoops and say, aim for that one, aim for this one. So you can start to use this safe, unsafe for the dog in really interesting ways. We have an exciting graphic on the next slide. It's just fascinating. Apparently there's a hippie, there's some hippie girl I'm not sure why she amused me so much, but the one that I have for the other one looks like Betty Crocker doing dog training. I don't know. So the dog's going to come right to the edge of his safe zone. He'll only approach as close as he cares to. So right there, the seated person throws the treat so that it lands preferably right at the dog, maybe at most half a body length in. That's all. The next slide. After he takes that treat, he suddenly gets skinnier and begins magically to run away. So that, he's moving towards safer, and I'll put two or three out there. So let's say he came this close, and you were the dog, I'd throw the cookie there as you take it, and you look back at me. Then I'm gonna throw them behind you and to the side, as long as the dog says that's still safe. Towards the side moves towards Ted, or moves towards Rich, and the dog goes, that's not safer. That's not safer at all. So I have to be very careful. It might be all of this space behind you is safer. Does that make sense? Next slide. Dog comes back. We start again. The dog will often be the one who, uh, not often, he is the one who will change the safe zone. He'll come back and say, well, this time I could be here. The nicest thing about treat retreat is it's such a forgiving technique because if you make a mistake, you'll only make it once. The dog either won't come forward and take the treat, he'll say, mm-mm. I don't feel safe doing that, in which case you can thren, send thumb, thin thumb the other way. Or he'll come in, take it, but he'll show you that was too much. And then you just make sure the next one's bigger, further away, safer. So you'll only make one bobble. And the dog gets so many repetitions, they're very forgiving. And this is all about them. Okay, next slide. So this is a little uh, field spaniel. So he's, he's got his little edge near me where he says, I feel safe. Remember I talked before about I want to see this dog standing in balance. So I'm judging as he comes back and orients to me and he says, I can hold my balance. I'm not leaning away that we're probably in an okay spot. That's his owner in the back there. So I can send the dog back and forth in his safe fur zone. The trick here is that the dog is not moving fearfully away from me, so we're not activating that part of the nucleus accumbens. We're sending him in seeking mode towards something he wants to get to. And this is a, this is a big and significant difference, and it was Temple Grandin who watched me presenting this, who said, oh, well, the reason that works is, I was like, oh, if you weren't Temple Grandin, I would hug you, but you are, so I won't. <laughs> I'll just be forever grateful that you tuned me into that, that really cool part. Okay. So this goes on like this for a while. The dog is free to walk away. And the other thing that happens when you send him back real far into the, the zone like that, I was trying to ask the owner, could you call him? I'm running out of chicken. Oh. Oh, yes, she says. So I just had to, I had to reload. <coughs> This is very typical of what happens. The dog's like, please, I'm busy. They tune their owner out, and he's like, well, I'm, so I had to turn, I had to make it really clear my body language. I'm really sorry, buddy, I don't need more food. I'm not playing that game with you right now. So that clip was now, I've reloaded. 
And he says, all right, do we have chicken yet? You know, there we go. You know you've got it right when the dog says, well, I, you know, I could do a few more rounds. We were good with that. We were all right. He's like, oh, all right, we're back to this game. All right, lady. And it's harder than you think to throw bits of chicken. Sometimes they get stuck on my, and I'm like, sorry. You see the dogs are like, we'll take your time. We're good. The worst are the toy dogs where you can only send them like a, you know, a billionth of a something. It's like, it's got to be some magical treat that you can flick. So the only rule is the treat has to be one that's really top value. I often use like uh, cheap chuck roast that I've cooked liver on top of in the crock pot till it all does some horrible thing. Yeah, it's bad, but the dogs love it. And I usually want it so it has a decent contrast with the floor. So if you think about this dog, how many repetitions he's getting, he says, oh, well, I, I could be that close to a human. Who knew? One of the issues that we had was his person was very gregarious and very outgoing. She's a really lovely Brazilian woman. So she would approach people and not notice that he stopped. He often stopped and then fed out the whole length of the leash going, I can't get any closer. She's like, come on, you're okay. He's like, no, I'm not. So it was really important to, to give this little guy this stuff. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So it goes on like this for a while. Just hit the space bar and it should go right over. There you go. All right, go ahead and click on this. This is a nine-month-old bearded collie, um, lovely little dog. It started growling at judges in the show. So this is her up to a, uh, she's making the rounds by herself in the class. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Got any cookies? So the people have been asked to build a little duration when she gets there. And when she's done with one person, the next person calls her. So it's hard looking at this dog to think, wow, that this dog would even be growling or hesitant about approaching people. She thinks this is the bestest game ever. It's lovely. In fact, I saw her about a year later and she said, you know what, after that class, she never growled at anybody again. She just approaches people and goes, I know how to do that. I know how to do that if there's three of you standing together, if you're walking, if you're talking, if you... She understood it. Okay, next slide. All right, so this is um, another point where we're going to be looming. And uh, Bill Wilson here is one of the best loomers on the planet. He's really tall. So it's like having lurch train your dogs. So he's deliberately, for Babe, looming playing rude dog person, and Babe says, yeah, okay. And this is the most important part, was that Babe learned how to walk away. It sounds so odd, but one of the things that the anxious and fearful dog needs to know is how to walk away, how to end a conversation and say, it's been good, but I have to go. They can get so stuck in a conversation this is where the dogs approach, they're liking it, and then they start to growl. And they say, uh, I'm not liking this anymore, but they don't know how to get out of it. He was presented as a dog who had begun, when people um, approached him, he had begun snapping at people. And again, after this class, he never snapped again. And you can see he's not having trouble with people looming. He's enjoying this immensely. And that was the sad part. She was so puzzled because this is a dog who really loves people. But he got himself way in over his skill level. Once we gave him the skills, he was not a particularly anxious or fearful dog. But the, the whole setting of meeting people made him anxious. All right, go on to the next <coughs> slide. This is literally, uh, we ran the class in January, February. This is, I think, October. Babe has seen none of these people since then. And they are all coming in making a whopper of a noise. Hey, how's it going? Yay, blah, blah, blah. Nobody has any food. And I wanted to see what his response was to just people and people moving and petting him and saying hi. And this is where you see the skill. He knows how to approach. If he feels uncomfortable, he knows how to exit. And you can certainly see in his body language, he's not particularly feeling distressed. In fact, he's thinking this is all right. But where are the cookies? <laughs> so this dog literally had one, two, three, four, five sessions in that class. So some total, some total, maybe 30 minutes each class was devoted to Babe. So I really like Treat Retreat. For the sociable dog, it just gives him more skills. So those of you who don't have dogs that are particularly anxious, but they're just buttheads, 
um, you know, they're not quite sure what to do, it gives them more skills. For the dogs that are less sociable, that don't really like people, it, again, gives them the skills because they're going to probably be asked to meet people over their lifetime. So when you can build their confidence to approach for cookies, you know, and they understand this game, they're much more willing to go along with that plan. And wherever the dog has more skills, the dog literally has more safety. It, it just comes down to that. All right, so when we put these things in perspective, if we want to reduce fear and anxiety, one of the things we need to focus on is coping. And this is what is required for coping. The dog has to literally have the knowledge. He has to have the information about the situation and what he is and is not to do. He needs very specific skills, and those can be really contextual. This is what we do on the trail. I had a, a lady we worked with last August at a trainer's workshop, and the dog was good in her shop. She had a little shop up in Vermont, and the dog was well socialized there. What freaked the dog out was when they were walking up on the Appalachian Trail, and hikers would come with or without dogs, with or without kids, didn't matter if it was groups, singles, it just freaked the dog out. And so she'd begun charging and barking at them and then retreating and barking and lunging and really upsetting the woman because she loved hiking with this dog. And when there was no one else around, they were having a great time out on the trail. So what we did was we set it up in the woods in my farm so that we set groups of trainers through the woods and we said, okay, so here's the skill set. We had people that were like, oh, can I see your dog? I love dogs. People going, doesn't bite, does he? Going through on the trail like that. We had, we had every variation of, you know, had too many, uh, you know, rusty nails in their thermos, hikers, <coughs> and other assorted groups. But first we taught the dog the skills. When we see something, these are the specific things you need to do. We will practice them, we will practice them, and now we'll practice them under very mild um, provocation. And then once the dog was like, oh, so when that happens, I do that. Got it. Pretty soon we couldn't set the dog off. That was one session in the woods, keeping the dog safe, teaching her specific skills, and then the owner simply had to go home and continue to use it. So she's got her great hiking companion back, and the dog no longer feels really anxious when she sees it, and neither does the owner, because they're like, we got, we got the gig, we know how to handle this. So it stopped being a trigger for an otherwise really nice dog. Support, we're back to you support the dog. You have to be there to have his back. You have to be there to pay attention to the answer to that question of how is this for you? Because that's what support always means. The people that we treasure most in our lives are the ones that when we aren't feeling up to snuff, they notice it instantly. They're like, what's wrong? Nothing. No, no, really, this is me, tell me. What's wrong? Others might buy it, but for you and your dog, you should be that person for them. So when they say, you know, I'm not so sure about that kid, believe them and act to, to, to help them in any way you need to. And success. Nothing makes us all more confident and braver in this world than being good at what we've done and doing it over and over again. So you're like, I got this. I know how to do this. That is a great gift to give a dog, is success. All right, next slide. <clears throat> this is what they used to write in maps, here be dragons, which meant there is some kind of crazy mojo going down in them waters. Don't go there. Here be dragons was just kind of a sailor's code for this is bad. And no one's quite sure what to do here. And this is when I look at maps and I look at labels. This is what I think. These are the words that we often see when we're talking about fearful, scary, you know, anxious dogs. Is, as well, he's very afraid. He's terrified. He's worried. He's anxious. All of this list. And what I want you to remember is just like a map is never really about the actual place, those labels are also just maps. The dog lives in that actual territory. The fear, the anxiety, those are his and he experiences them 100%. Whether you actually go along there with him, whether you empathize with him or not, that's his. So I think the great gift we can give them is to keep the light on in their eyes. Because there's something about a dog who says, I'm not afraid and I'm having a good day. When you ask, how is this for you? The dog's answer is, it's awesome. I am loving this life I have. To me, that's what being in relationship with a dog is all about. So thank you very much.